If I would ask you to think of the name Casio, you most likely would associate that name with electronic calculators, electronic musical instruments and affordable digital watches. But did you know Casio also produced computers? If you follow my channel, I'm sure you do. I previously have introduced you to my Casio FP200, the handheld computer. In two episodes, I took that computer apart, I cleaned it and I tested it. It was a computer based on a clone of the Intel 8085 CPU. This time, we shall have a look at Casio's FP1000 series. But before we dive into this amazing piece of computer innovation, let me give you a very brief history of the company behind it. What you today know as Casio actually started back in 1946 as Koshio Manufacturing. The founder was Tajo Kashio and he was born in 1917 in Japan. The company was just a small subcontractor factory that made microscope parts and gears. But when his brother Tashio Kashio joined the company, things started to change and one big change was the invention of this. Yes, this device was a world first. The Yubiwa finger ring pipe. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Fast forward 11 years. All Tarako Kashio's brother have joined the company. And in 1957, the company introduced the world's first entirely electronic compact calculator the 14-A. Later that same year, they decided to change the name to what we know as Casio Keisanki Kabushiki Gaisha. Yes, Casio Computer Corporation Limited. In the 70s, the company not only continued to produce more advanced calculators, but also introduced the first inkjet typewriter in 1971. The first scientific calculator, the FX1. The first electronic watch, the Cachitron QW02. And a range of cash registers. In 1980, the company moved into electronic musical instruments with their first electronic keyboard, the Cachitone 201. And then in 1982, they took a natural step into the computer market with the Casio PB100 pocket computer. The computer that would lay the ground for the next coming Casio computers, such as the Casio FP200 released that same year and today's guest star, the Casio FP1000 series. With that out of the way, I think it's time for me to introduce you to the Casio FP1000 series. And as you can see, I have two and they're not the same. This series, the Casio FP1000 series came out in two different versions. The 1000, which is the one behind me and the 1100, which is in front of me. It's that unit that we are talking about. You could then buy additional extra features for it, such as a double-sided disk drive, with two disk drives in it, amongst other peripherals. And today we're gonna look at this computer down here. Then I will compare it to the difference between this computer and obviously that one. In another episode, I will walk you through the disk unit so we can see what features is inside this one. Just a heads up. I have cleaned the outer of both of the monitors, both of the computers and the disk drives. I actually also have cleaned the inside of both of the disks. Um, so we are not gonna use much time on that. 
but the keyboards, both of them are very filthy. So we will start figuring out how to dig into the keyboards so I can clean them. Thereafter, I will open up the actual computer and we will have a look inside. Spoiler alert, it features two CPUs. Let me arrange the camera and let's dig into the keyboard. So I'll move the other computers away, the disk drives and the monitors. So right now, just before we start on cleaning the keyboard, it's a little bit dirty and I want to clean it anyway. So before we do that, I just want to walk you through the actual computer unit. So if I move the keyboard a little bit away and I move the actual unit over here, I hope it's possible to see Personal Computer FP1100 Casio. In front, we have a light that seems to be stuck somewhere inside. So when we open this one up, probably need to move it out. This is the power button for turning it on and off. And in front, on this side, the keyboard is connected and can't be removed from it as it is here. There's nothing on either of the sides besides some cooling. And in the back, we have the power over here. And this thing is when you hook up external units that can then ground towards this one. We have a reset button. We have a one and a two. So these are expansion slots in the back. I will come back to all of this. There's a printer port. There is a plug for RGB color. There's a plug for black and white color. And then there's a plug for the cassette recorder. And here is the same as over there. This is for external stuff to ground it to the actual computer, which then brings us back to the back. And then let's have a look at the keyboard and see how we get inside it. So let's see how we get inside. Let's turn it around. There's nothing on the sides that indicates where I need to screw or hook out anything. So let's turn it around. Let's have a look. I can see Phillips screws. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Yes, the back ones here are just feet. So let's unscrew those. Six screws out of the way. And you may wonder why are we actually starting with the probably least interesting part of the computer, the keyboard. The reason is simple. I have cleaned the out of the computer units themselves and I'm just missing out on this. So I just want to get this out of the way. So that's why we start here. Just stay and we'll go into the computer, open it up and you can see how amazing it is inside. Let's see how we open this one up. Um, it just kind of like lifts up like this. Obviously there is a cable from the computer into the back of the keyboard coming out there and then going into the top of the keyboard. What a weird design. So let's be careful. I will assume that if we have a look, I see a screw here, one up there, maybe one there, one over there, one over there, and one over there. That seems to be what keeps the actual keyboard connected to the plastic. So let's remove that also. There we go, let me put the keyboard a little bit away so we can see the top casing. It is dirty inside and outside. So that's gonna be washed. 
I was hoping that the cable was not hardwired directly into the PVC. PVC, so, so in this case, we kind of like stocked a little bit here with this unit connected to there. I hope I could have taken this out. So that's gonna be fun. Yeah. So I think what we need to do here is just to remove all the keys and let's have a look at the key stands. It's actually a very nice keyboard. It's very firm, it has a nice feeling. No clicking. But there's a story behind the computer itself. I actually, well, my uncle actually owned one in back in the early 80s. And I remembered programming uh, some systems for him on this computer. And I distinctly remember every time you punched on the keys, the computer said beep. And now that I think about it, I actually also think you could then write beep off and then it will turn that noise off and then beep on again and then you will beep beep every time you're doing it. But let's not drive into more, more of that. Let me just remove all the keys and let me have a think about what I'm going to do with this problem over here. So first key is out. <laughs> And um, there's a spring. This is the key. That's the spring. And well, the key itself doesn't do anything specific, so it's just a regular stamp. So beware of spring and a key. So with all the keys out, including the springs, which makes it take double of the time, but hey ho, it is dirty. So we need to clean this. I just want to tell you that I noticed that the bigger keys seem to have higher springs. And if I just visually inspect them, I can see they're actually higher. So you need to distinguish those. One, two, three, four, five, including spacebar keys from the rest. That out of the way, let me clean the keys and the top casing of the keyboard. And let me um, have a thought about how I'm gonna clean this without ruining anything and then let me come back to you. So, see you in a bit. So let's um, look at the keyboard, the back of it. I have cleaned this with IPA now also. And if we turn it around, put it down here. There's a lot of screws all over the board that needs to be taken out, I assume, so that we can take the PCB out and clean the actual contacts. So let me do that. I noticed two things down here. I see a speaker. We were talking about that I recall in my youth in the 80s that when I was working on it, every time I touched the key, it was saying a beep noise. That must be the speaker for that. Up here, we have a Texas instrument SN74159 or N. That's just a decoder or multiplexer 
um, for handling all the um, keystrokes and sending it towards the computer and then some glue logic here. I also just discovered I'm missing a screw down here. That's a lot of screws, like crazy amount, but that's how it is. Let's see how what's gonna happen when we reveal this. Down here, I see a strip. So I just want it. Okay, that's just there. So that shouldn't be a problem. So I should be able to lift this off. I will assume if I lift it off, do the keys fall out? Yes, they do. So let's try and move it the other way and lift this one out like that. And there we go. And let's move this around. It's actually not that dirty. The key stamps themselves, let me find them and take one out. They look like the other cashew that I featured on the channel, the FP200. So, a little bit. So if I find a key, so here we have the key stamp, which is conductive in this area. So let me find a small screwdriver. Sorry, there we are. I hope this is in focus, yeah. So this part is the conductive part. There's a plastic ribbon going underneath it and over to the other side. And obviously that's the stem and the key caps go on top of it. So that's the mechanism for this keyboard. That's a lot of them. So let me just very briefly have a look if there's any keys that look suspicious i will um, it doesn't seem so they actually look very like brand new so that is really nice so let me just very quickly give this some ipa and then i'll build it back together again so it's all assembled again nice and clean so that's good right one thing and let me explain why this one is over there so if you look in the front and we look in the front there and we look on the table this black piece that sits here fell off so I need to find a way because this is just completely disintegrating and there's no way for me to fix this. So I need to find something like it to put over here. So it will end up being black as it should be. But I'll fix that off camera eventually. It's now time to open this one up. And this is what you've been waiting for, right? So let's get ready, open this one up. And obviously let's look at the power supply first of all. There we have it. And um, with a lot of screws. In the back that needs to be taken off on the outside three here four up here three more over there and three down there and once that's taken off this lead can be pulled out and this casing up here which is the top casing to my recall should be able to be pushed this way so let me just try it with that And it just slides out. And let me turn it back again, just to explain to you that there's still this metal plate here that actually falls out. So 
better taking this off in the beginning. There we go. I'll come back to the switches down here once we will be talking about the computer itself and obviously about the board. There's a board here. Underneath all of this, there's a second board with the second, the second CPU. But we'll be focusing on this area right now, which is the power supply. So in order for us to get inside the power supply, well, to unhook the power supply from the actual computer, I have to screw out four screws, one there, one down there, one down there, and one down there. And then additional two screws up here. That now makes it possible for me to take off the main board. And I unhooked down here the ribbon cable to the other board. And we have a few ground cables going into it. So if I lift those up too, like this, I should be able to take out that board. If I just remember that I have this board. So I can just lay, sorry, I can just lay it down the side. I could desort it down there, but let's just leave it like this, which gives me access to the power plug down here into the power supply. I also have some power here, which we need to dig into and figure out where they go. So I probably need to unscrew a few more screws. So let me come back once that's done. So four screws has been put out. One, two, three, four. I also realized that I can actually pull this missing cable out, which then relieves me from the main CPU motherboard. Now I should be able to pull this one out. which has just some wiring going up here. So this is for the different voltages. So this is a heat, sorry, you can't see anything. So from the power supply over here, we have some wires going into all of these. And these are, this is a D and neck D587. This is very difficult to read, but I think it says D1031. Yes, D, no, sorry, maybe it's DJ031. So these are voltage regulator that gets hot. This is why you have the this huge heat sink over here. So we don't need to think about that that much. So I'll just put it back and just look at the beautiful motherboard, which we'll come back to. So power supply. We need to figure out down here what voltage we have. And I know that because it doesn't state on the actual motherboard, but there are plus five, there's obviously ground, and there should be like a minus five and tw minus 12. The reason why I know this is that the boards from Casio back then, they always, had these access points for you to check voltages. So you just need to figure out which one of them they are. So there's a minus 12 here, a, mi a minus five volt, and maybe there will be others. There's a plus 12 down there. And obviously that is the same for this. So this is what we get out of this cable. Just need to figure out which voltage is which. So I will have to measure on the board down here where I can see a connection on the ports towards these that will give me which voltages. Once I figure that out, I shall obviously make a diagram for other people. So I've been poking around and making some notes. And what I have discovered is that <clears throat> very easy. I have all these access points on the board as it's set. So I have a ground, minus 12, plus five, plus 12. So I uh, just 
connected the different pins to the different ones and over here I measured whether there is connectivity or not and then I just moved over so red is ground white which is the next one up I figured out that's plus 12 uh, sorry plus 5 then there's a blue which is the next up and the blue one is plus 12 yes and the next is yellow and yellow would then probably minus 12 which it is which leaves me with most likely minus five but the last cable i can't find any connections to any anything so right now i have no idea what that is but let's just turn it on and measure if this is the right voltage that we're actually also getting so let me find the probes and take this over here see if you can see i hope you can and then let's hook in ground and find the right one there we go so i'll just hook it in here to red which is ground and i'll turn it on and then we can measure so white that should be five five volts more or less spot on 5.073 the blue one which is the next one up i hope you can see it but i'll say the colors anyway so the blue one that should then be plus 12 12.24 spot on again yellow that should then be minus 12 12 sorry minus 12.31 and then the green one which i have no clue what that is that gives me a reading of 6.24 volts. I cannot figure out what that is. Obviously, before I even turned it on, I checked <clears throat> the board. I looked for the capacitors and saw, let me turn it off, and saw if there was anything bulging or leaking, anything smelling weirdly. And um, I also looked at the fuses. There's a fuse down there and there's a fuse over here. This is where the power actually comes in, gets into the transformer, the line is uh, transformed over here and then gets rectified and the voltages are then controlled as we saw in the beginning over here. There are also some pot meters so I could adjust the voltage coming out. It's like this one. Um, so I tested all that before I turned it on. <clears throat> no need for me to show you that. So. I am actually very confident in just hooking up the board and then testing all the test points on the actual board. So let's do this. No need for, but let's, and then let's hook up ground and then we can measure all the other ones. Just need to find the right measuring cable for that. So ground was down here and minus 12 is this one so let's turn it on and if you can see i hope let me see you can't i'm so sorry but i let me just move the computer a little bit more away so minus 12 on the actual board is minus 12.39 plus 5 is 4.974 and plus 12 is plus 12.14 that's it let's turn it off so i can say that the board is actually getting the right voltages so let's say check for power supply let's have a look at the two boards and let me try to see if i can figure out what they are so Immediately, I see some RAM up here, 
and I see somebody has probably had some errors, so they put in a socket here. <coughs> Sorry for that. And then I see a CPU, come back to that. I see an EEPROM and another EEPROM, I think, here. And then I see a lot of glue logic, such like the 47 series. So all of this is more or less glue logic. And let's have a look at this specific one. Well, in the beginning, let's have a look at the board itself. Um, this is the system board, which is holding the central processor unit right over there. And this one is actually called the main board up here. This one is called the sub board. So on the main board, we have the CPU with the RAM for the CPU with some BIOS over here. And I know actually that this, um, not BIOS, sorry, these EEPROMs over there, they hold the basic language, you know, the C82 basic ROMs. And the chips up here, these up here, let me have a closer look. I just need to take it. So they are, which way do they turn? They turn this way. So they are D4164C-3. I recall these RAMs at the desk three. That means the access time is 150 nanoseconds, I believe. Let me just quickly look. Yes, it is, 150 nanoseconds. So these are um, 65, 537 times one bit uh, DRAM modules up here. So none of this is actually the video memory because the video memory is on the sub board up here. Come to that in just a split of a second. What we saw when I pulled this one out is that it, this board besides the two ground cable that we had up here, is connected via the ribbon. And the ribbon goes here. Additionally, we also had this wire running there. Sorry, there we are. So before I move on, let me um, just ensure that I smear it a little bit with this, just to remove any oxidation that could be in there. So let me just do that quickly. And let me just find something to rinse some of the access over here. Sorry, there we go. So that was that connection. Then we also have these two, which we saw on this casing here. Sorry, let me move it in. This casing here, so if I turn the unit around, these are the two expansion slots. They are these two connector. So let me also just give them some lubrication. Now that we are, now that we have the board in our hand. There we go. And just to ensure that it works, this is one of the expansion cartridge that actually goes in. And I will, I'll come back to this later. And I will just hook it in here just to make the connection on and off. It does feel much smoother now. So with that out of the way, let's take it away and let's move forward this unit. So let's move this away so we can have a peek inside what this is all about. So this is a way bigger board and let me bring forward this one. So that was the main CPU. This is an Z80A CPU. And this one actually runs at eight, sorry, at four megahertz. Down here, we have the coprocessor or the second CPU, which is this one up there. 
So this subprocessor, that's just a single chip, an 8-bit micro, uh, microprocessor with four kilobyte of ROM inside it also. Over here, we have an EEPROM. I don't know right now what this is good for. I will assume, because this is memory for video, that this is the character set. There's another one over there, which I seriously have no idea what that's good for. And now that we see this board, let me just say that when we were struggling with the keyboard, that the cable here couldn't get it off inside the keyboard. It's actually possible just to unhook it here, unscrew these screws, and then on the back of the actual keyboard over there, you can then remove the cable. So there was a solution for that problem. So besides the microprocessor, the character ROM and this ROM over there, we also have some memory. And between this model, which is the 1100, and the other one I have behind me, the only difference is this holds the full populated memory for the computer, and the other one only holds a quarter of it because this one can produce color and the other one can't produce any color. So speaking about the RAM, so the actual CPU, as I said, has the same RAM on both of the models. And this obviously holds a total of 64K. The video board or this area of this board, which is for the video RAM, that holds in this case 48k and if i had the 1000 open you will only see that it only holds 16k so it can only produce the black and white color so that's kind of like the difference obviously before we put all this together i will unhook this eprom this eprom and this eprom and I will put them on my EEPROM reader and make an image of it and put it up to my archive.org. So if anybody needs it, it will be there. Let me put everything back together again. And then I am actually ready to turn the computer on and see if we get anything out, if it actually runs. If not, I have my oscilloscope ready and we will measure some of the pinouts for it. So let me screw this in and put the main board on afterwards and then come back to you. All sampled again back where we started more or less. And I promised to come back to these switches in the back of the computer. So these switches tells the computer how it's set up. So for instance, it will tell the number of character on the screen, whether it should be like 80 character mode or 40 character mode. It also tells which screen mode you want to run the computer when it turns on. There's a screen mode zero and a screen mode one. Obviously only this model, the 1100 support, uh, supports both modes. And the other one behind me, the 1000, only supports screen mode zero. Then, so this is actually switch number one that tells uh, 40 or 80, switch number two, screen mode uh, zero or one, uh, switch number three, that tells you whether or not this computer is to be seen as being an FP1100 or an 1000 model. So that's on screen number three. Um, sorry, on switch number three. On switch number four, that is for the cassette drive down there. That's the bolt rate for that. So either this is set to 300 bolt or it's set to 1200 bolt. The two left ones, so five and six, they have no, meet, no meetings at all. So let me now turn all this around. like this if i can there we go bring forward the keyboard that's clean and
and move the camera a little bit further away. And then let's hook up the beautiful green screen monitor. This is the FP1001. There exist a 1002 and 1003. The two other ones are color monitors. This is the 12 inch, the other ones are 14 inch. Sadly, I don't have those. But this is the connector into the computer. And in the back of the monitor, we have the normal plug for that, which goes in here. And the ohm resistance is set to 75. So let's turn it around. And let me go on the other side and hook both power and this into the computer and the monitor. So it's ready and let's see if it works. If it doesn't, that's going to be episode two then. There'll anyway be an episode th uh, two or maybe three where I will e explain about all the peripherals that you can hook up to it. Before I turn it on, obviously this is Z80, Z80A clone CPU from NEC and this one's at four megahertz. So this is a CPM machine, but there's no CPM because there's no disk drive. In order to see for CPM to work, you need to have a disk with the boot medium that will actually boot up into CPM. So if that's not present, this just becomes a basic computer. So when we start it up, it should show us that it is ready for us to make some small basic program. So for the second time today, let's do this. Hope no magic smoke, because then I will have to open everything up again before. I know the monitor's working because one of my good friend, Peter, had the two monitor with him and he was checking them for me. The reason for this is because Obviously, this is high voltage inside and I'm not skilled and I would rather be honest and have um, people who actually really know their skills test those kind of things for me. So he has tested it and he has found a fault in one of the both of the monitor. It was actually the same fault. It was the vertical hold that was um, kind of like that. So we had to change one of the capacitors inside the monitors. And after that, he tested them on his bench back home at his bench. So the monitor's working, that I know. We know the power supply is working, giving out the right voltages. So let's do it. We have a success. Wouldn't you know? That's cool. Let me move us closer just to the screen so we can see what it actually states. So, it's a little bit difficult to get it really on the screen because it's summer all of a sudden here. So it's very bright. Um, just play with the contrast, everybody screaming right now. Yeah, well, it doesn't do that much on the screens. So if I put the brightness all up, I'm assuming this would work. So Casio C82 basic version 1.1 May 10th, 1982. Ready on program zero. I will on another episode explain something about the basic and we will probably make some programs. Basically, the program, the basic in itself, just like the FP200 handheld computer I have back home, can hold 10 different programs. And from one program, you can call other programs. So we are now in the area of program zero. The other thing, is 
this fantastic thing. Remember I told you that it was beeping. I could briefly recall that when I was punching in stuff on the screen, the computer back then, it was saying beep constantly. And that is actually the fact. And it is coming from the keyboard speaker. If I write beep off, it doesn't do it anymore. And obviously, if I do beep on, it should be back. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on and so forth. Every single key is working. And so on and so forth. So that's very nice. What a nice journey with this unit. As I stated earlier, I have actually worked on this computer, not this specific one, but that model. And that was when my uncle back in 1984, maybe could be 83. I'm not 100% sure was a real estate sailor and um, he actually had this and on that computer he had a program to calculate mortgages and stuff like that when you buy a house here in Denmark. It didn't work as it should and every time the government changed stuff he was struggling getting the program up and working. So I actually made him a complete calculation program with that. My father was actually building houses here in the area where I'm living back then and my uncle was selling them and when we were having open house on new development I actually took this computer and set it up in the um, showroom at the new house and I had actually drawn many of my father's drawings of the new developed houses. So people not only could be, have calculated their mortgages right on the spots, see if something for them, but they could also see other houses that my father had or would build and I draw it on the screen. So I have fun memories on this computer. I think I recall that I was struggling with the basic because it was not 100% the same as my Amstrad or my Olivetti M24 basic. So it was a little bit different, but it was working. So fun memories and I'm really happy I have this computer back again. That's this for episode one. There will obviously be an episode two where I will go through the floppy disk drive and other peripherals for this unit. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about the basic programs, but we'll see. So stay tuned and you know, give me a thumbs up if you like this video or that one. And please do remember subscribe all the YouTube stuff, you know, by now, right? See you soon. My name is Taibo and goodbye.